Canada really is no stranger to strange and mysterious lakes. But as I continue to do research and make videos like these, there's one lake that keeps popping up in my mind that I think is probably the most unique and mysterious of them all. And this remote lake stands near the top of my bucket list of places to visit in Canada. So in this video, let's take a look at what I think is perhaps the most unique lake in all of Canada. This is the Pingaluk Lake, located in the Pingaluit Crater of Northern Quebec. And as always, this is Ali, and welcome back to Urban Atlas. The Pingaluk Lake sits in the northern regions of the Ingava Peninsula, approximately 200 kilometers from the shores of Hudson Bay, and approximately 100 kilometers from the Hudson Strait. It's about 1,700 kilometers from the city of Montreal. That means that the distance from Montreal to the lake is approximately the same distance from Montreal to the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Safe to say that the lake is located in a very remote area. Now, despite its isolation, the Inuit have known about this place for thousands of years. They call it Pingaluk, meaning where the land rises. Though it was also known as Chrysalai due to the lake's stunning clarity. But it wasn't until 1943 that Western science took notice. When a US Air Force crew on a weather reconnaissance mission spotted something unusual from the aircraft, a perfectly circular lake in the middle of the tundra. Initially called the Chubb Crater after the pilot Frederick W. Chubb, it was later renamed to New Quebec Crater and finally given its proper Inuktitut name, Pingaluit, in 1999, recognizing the indigenous people who knew this place long before any aerial survey. The crater wasn't seriously studied until 1950 when geologist Ben Mean led the first scientific expedition here and what they confirmed would reshape our understanding of impact craters across Canada and possibly the world. So now I want to take you guys back to approximately 1.5 million years ago. Imagine for a second during the Pleistocene Epoch, a meteorite approximately 120 meters in diameter was hurling down the Earth at speeds exceeding 25,000 kilometers an hour when it struck what is now northern Quebec. The impact released an energy equivalent to approximately 8,000 Hiroshima bombs. In an instant, the meteorite vaporized, the bedrock composed primarily of Precambrian granite and gneiss that are over 2 billion years old, was pulverized, melted and thrown outward in every direction. The impact crater created roughly a 3.4 kilometer diameter crater of excavated rock to depths up to several hundred meters. Interestingly, the crater rim rises approximately 160 meters above the surrounding tundra, and the crater floor sits about 400 meters below the rim's highest point. The closer you look here, the more you realize that geology tells a violent story. Scientists here have identified shock quartz, a mineral that only forms under the extreme pressures of meteorite impacts or nuclear explosions. They found impact breccia, a chaotic mixture of shattered rock fragments fused together by the heat of the impact. And if you look closer, there are microscopic features in the rock called planar deformation features. These are essentially tiny fractures that serve as fingerprints to large-scale explosions, particularly those caused by meteorites. Now what makes Pingaluit particularly interesting and valuable to scientists is its pristine preservation. Unlike many impact craters, it hasn't been significantly eroded or filled with sediment. The circular shape remains nearly perfect, one of the most geometrically pristine impact craters on Earth. The bedrock surrounding the crater itself consists of ancient metamorphic and igneous rock, part of the Canadian Shield, some of the oldest continental crust on our planet. And this stability has helped to preserve the crater structure for over a million years. Now, despite the actual depth of the total crater being 400 meters, the depth of the actual lake inside the crater is about 267 meters, making it one of the deepest lakes in North America relative to its surface area. The lake measures about 2.8 kilometers in its diameter, filling much of the crater floor. But depth and size don't tell the full story here, because this lake contains some of the purest fresh water ever measured. Its salinity is extraordinarily low, approximately 3 milligrams per liter. That's roughly 30 times purer than typical freshwater and comparable to almost distilled water. The water is so transparent that visibility can exceed 35 meters, rivaling the clearest tropical seas on our planet. 
But that makes you think, how did such pure water accumulate here? Well, the answer lies in its isolation as well as ice. You see, the lake has no inlets or outlets. It's entirely fed by rain, snow, and the melting of ice. The crater walls are completely impermeable, preventing groundwater seepage. This means virtually nothing can contaminate this water. No sediment flows in from other streams, and no dissolved minerals is leaching in from surrounding soils. That means the lake has been accumulating water and freezing seasonally for thousands and thousands of years, slowly concentrating its purity through natural distillation. During winter, much of the lake freezes, and ice thickness can reach up to 3 to 4 meters. When that water freezes, dissolved salts and impurities are excluded from the ice crystal structure, further purifying what remains liquid below. In a way, this lake acts as a time capsule. You see, in 2007, scientists drilled sediment cores from the lake's bottom, extracting material that contains a climate record spanning 130,000 years. These cores preserve pollen, microorganisms, and chemical signatures that reveal how climate has fluctuated through multiple ice ages. The lake's isolation means its sediment record is unusually undisturbed, a pristine archive of Arctic climatic history. That's because these sediment cores give us a lot of information. The oxygen isotope ratios in these sediments tell us about past temperatures. Pollen grains reveal which plants grew in different periods, indicating whether the climate was warmer or colder. This data has helped scientists understand how the Arctic responded to natural climate variations long before human industrial activity. And I mentioned previously the lake's depth, 267 meters. That is particularly important because at this depth, the bottom water remains permanently cold, around 4 degrees Celsius, and largely isolated from surface mixing. This creates distinct thermal layers and makes the lake meromictic during certain periods, meaning that the water layers don't completely mix seasonally as they do in most temperate lakes. Pingaluit exists in one of the Earth's harshest environments, the Arctic tundra. Here, winter temperatures plunge below negative 40 degrees Celsius, and the brief summer warms to barely 10 degrees Celsius. The region receives relatively little precipitation, only about 400 millimeters annually. The vegetation reflects these extreme conditions. The crater rim and surrounding landscape supports typical tundra plant communities. Low-growing shrubs like dwarf birch and willow, grasses, lichens, and mosses. Nothing grows taller than knee height here. There are no trees for hundreds of kilometers in any direction. We're well north of the tree line here. Now, given this crater lake's extreme isolation and harsh climate, you might expect a barren wasteland in terms of wildlife. But life persists here in remarkable ways. The crater and surrounding region are frequented by caribou from the Leaf River herd, one of the largest caribou populations in all of North America, numbering hundreds of thousands of animals. These arctic ungulates migrate through the region seasonally, grazing on lichens, sedges, and dwarf shrubs. Meanwhile, you have arctic foxes patrolling the tundra their thick, white winter coats providing perfect camouflage in the snow. In the summer, their fur turns darker, almost a brown color. And these resourceful predators hunt lemmings, ground nesting birds, and scavenge caribou carcasses. Lemmings themselves are a keystone species, small rodents whose population cycles dramatically affect the entire ecosystem. When lemming populations boom, foxes thrive. When they crash, these predators struggle. Arctic hares, with their enormous hind feet acting as natural snowshoes, bound across the landscape. In winter, they're nearly invisible against the snow. In addition to the mammals, waterfowl also call this lake and its surrounding area home. Now, interestingly, despite being such an isolated lake, the lake is home to fish species, specifically the Arctic char. Now, because this lake is not connected to any other bodies of water or any rivers or streams, there's a lot of theories going around as to how these fish ended up in this lake. Were the arctic char eggs transported through bird poop from one lake to another? Possible. But in all reality, it's probably much more simple than that. While today the lake is not connected to any other bodies of water, historically, it might have been. Keep in mind, this area was covered by glaciers approximately 10 to 20,000 years ago. And it's possible that those glaciers created glacial rivers that ended up connecting this lake to other larger bodies of water. And that's probably how Arctic char ended up in the lake. Not as fancy as the bird poop theory, but probably the correct one. Although we can't be for sure. 
for the Inuit people of the Nunavik region, and Galloway has a spiritual and cultural significance extending back generations. Traditional knowledge recognized this place as special long before any scientific understanding explained why. Today, the Pingalouit National Park protects over a thousand square kilometers of Arctic wilderness surrounding the crater. And as you can imagine, access is challenging. There are no roads, and visitors must fly in to the nearest Inuit village. Then, they either fly there by helicopter or undertake a grueling multi-day trek only a few hundred people visit annually making it one of Canada's least visited national parks. But this isolation is both a challenge and a blessing. While the isolation limits economic opportunities for the local communities, it also protects the crater from human impact and degradation. And thus, the Pingalut Crater and the Pingaluk Lake remind us that the Earth is part of a dynamic solar system, subject to bombardment from outer space. And as always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment below what you'd like to see next, Subscribe to my page if you haven't done so already. The vast majority of my viewers are still not subscribed to my channel. So please, if you like content like this, hit that subscribe button. It'll really make my day. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.